Okay, so let's talk about genetics and how it relates to evolution of populations. So we've talked a little bit about, or we've talked quite a bit about how DNA works and how DNA makes proteins, okay? Well, what we're going to talk about now is how those proteins we know make characteristics and how those characteristics change over time and change how, you know, populations interact with the environment, how, which then basically impacts how our population, or I'm sorry, how our planet Earth um, functions. Because guys, we're all in this together. That's really what the name of this lecture should be. We're all in this together. You guys and your sick crushes on Um, Okay, so there's five major agents of evolutionary change. So what that means is evolution happens by one of the five things, right? We know first is mutation, okay? That's when your DNA is altered. We, do, we can see this through things like UV light, right? That can damage your DNA. Smoking can damage your DNA. Um, well, you can have spontaneous mutations that change your DNA. So the one thing is a mutation, right? Your DNA just basically a base pair changes, and that then changes the proteins that are made, changes everything, okay? The other thing is gene flow, right? So it's kind of like the movement. It's like the movement of genes, right? How genes, like, for example, pollination is one. Pollination causes, um, you're taking essentially, not to get weird, you're basically um, in pollen is sperm cells. So the, the sperm cells are moving, right? They're moving around. Um, so that, that gene flow, the movement of the sperm and the egg cells, which contain that DNA, then can, can alter populations. Um, Non-random mating. So, for example, we have our peacock. Our peacocks are like this, kind of like teenage boys showing off, if you know what I mean. There's a, they're, trying to, they're deliberately trying to get a mate. These ridiculous feathers are trying to get a mate. When boys do, like, flips on a skateboard, they're trying to get a mate, okay? So this kind of, like, showing off behavior is non-random. They want you to select them. They, they're saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. When boys do disgusting things, when they, um, you know, are acting like fools, they're trying to say, pick me, pick me, pick me, okay? Um, the other one you have is genetic drift, where you have essentially not just one. Gene flow is kind of like where you have, like, just genes in general moving. Genetic drift is where you have a bunch of genes moving that then changes populations. What I mean is this. You have, for example, where you have a bunch of, say like in this case, little tiny red birds, they go, they move to an island, and they form a bunch of red birds, right? So this, these yellow, um, these, the yellow, the genes that coat for yellow feathers are essentially um, moved out, right? They become extinct because of this genetic drift where you have these little red birdies, they go, they move, they form their own population, they multiply, Okay. Um, we're going to talk about this. We see this, and I know I keep talking about the Irish, but hey, this, it, you see this. You see this with these, like, with, Ireland's a great example of this because it was an island. It's an island country, right? So a lot of um, genes that you see that are very prevalent in Ireland, you don't necessarily see at the population at large because they were secluded. So we'll talk more about that. And then you have selection, right? You have the predator selecting certain things to eat. So for example, these little green guys are going to live. These, these little blue guys are getting killed because these, the little red birds can then select for those that's going to then um, influence the population, the evolution, because these guys are going to die out. I know that's kind of confusing. Um, we will go over this in class too. So especially I think gene flow and genetic drift are very, um, they're, they're very nuanced and that can be difficult to understand. But anyway, so just know that populations, evolution, are governed by genes, by your DNA. Your DNA, your genes control population, okay? We know, for example, a population, this is kind of a review, is just a bunch of the same species, right? We know that a gene, when we talk about a gene pool, right? We can talk about the res gene pool. We can talk about the Chicago gene pool. It can be any um, collection of alleles. Now, remember, we, we talked about the, the difference between alleles and genes. Alleles are just a type of gene, right? So you have the gene is for blue eyes, and allele, I'm sorry, the gene is for eye color, 
the allele would be a blue eye, co eye color gene or a brown eye color gene. I'll say that again. The gene is like, is the trait, right? It's eye color. The allele are the, your options, your blue or your brown. And then we have allele frequency, just how common that allele is in that population. Ba-boom. So evolution is a change in the allele frequencies. It's a change in the, the genes, essentially, the genes that are expressed. So it's not like this thing where if I spend a lot of time in the bathtub, if I spend a lot of time in water, I'm going to evolve and I'm going to have gills. No, it's not going to happen with one person. It happens in a population over time, and it's the change of the frequency of alleles. So it's going to be things like we see this with, with humans. We see um, wisdom teeth. Human beings, the amount of people that have wisdom teeth is decreasing. So what does that mean? The amount of people that have the alleles for wisdom teeth is decreasing over time. We are evolving. Get ready, everybody. So in order for evolution to happen, those five agents, you have to essentially get rid of them, okay? So you have to have no genetic drift, no gene pool, no mutation. I'm sorry, take that back. In order for a population not to evolve, in order for a population to become stable, you have to remove all these, okay? And there are some populations that are very secluded that where you see this. Um, no genetic drift, no gene, fl gene flow, no mutation, no random mating, right? Or I'm sorry, random mating, or no natural selection. And we'll talk, like I said, we'll talk more about these five agents uh, all right, so who cares? What, what, why are you even doing this? We're talking about these two bros called Hardy and Weinberg, right? They're actually um, mathematicians. So what they discovered is, um, or statisticians, I should say, um, they're not biologists. They're statisticians, they're mathematicians, they're physicists. But they were looking at these, it's a mathematical model that explains how do populations work. And what it is, think of this Hardy Weinberg as our control group, right? So basically, it's like these populations are, if it's something is in equilibrium, it means it's stable. It is not evolving, okay? That doesn't happen. There's always, for the most part, going to be some evolution. Granted, like I said, there will be some um, sort of like bizarre populations here and there that we do see to be more stable, but for the most part, everything is, is, is changing, right? Um, and as it should. To quote Malcolm, the, um, the cool guy, Jeff Goldblum, in um, the original Jurassic Park, life finds a way, you know, like we're constantly changing and, and, and growing and developing and evolving. So this Hardy-Weinberg business is the control. It's this idea of a non-moving population. It's a non-evolving population. Here's why we use it, though. It's your control group. We use it to compare. So we use it to see, okay, we've got this population of finches, of people, of bacteria, whatever, and something's going on, and we want to know what, what is, what's working on it, what agent, is it the mutation, is it gene flow, is it, what is it, and we want to work to see um, what is happening to this population. We can use their model to help us better understand what's going on in these populations. Sidebar, I'm going to have all my photos taken with me at a chair like this, just kind of like, what? I think that's a really baller stance for a scientist. I think it says, I'm relaxed. I think it says, you know, uh, do you have an appointment? Uh, I think it says, I'm, you know, my pants are very large. Deal with it. And I respect it. Okay, so what does this Hardy-Weinberg theorem mean? There are two kind of aspects to it, okay? The first one is going to be, we're going to look at the alleles, the, the actual genes. So say you have a population of, say you're me and you have a dream population of cats, okay? You've got two alleles. You've got the big B and the little b, okay? That big B is going to be for black fur, that little b is going to be for white fur, okay? So, um, and you've got your little, your, little sweet bitty, your little sweet kitties here, okay? So the dominant allele, we know it's dominant because it's uppercase, and we also know it's dominant because it's seen more in the population, right? So this, the frequency is going to be P. The frequency of the recessive allele is going to be Q. Why P and Q? There actually is a reason why they picked P and Q, and I can't remember. Um, anyway, so that makes sense, right? You add up all the, the black 
alleles plus all the white alleles, you're going to get 1. So what that means is the frequencies must add up to um, 100%, right? So say, there you go. So they have to equal 100% because it's a frequency. It's a decimal. Okay. All right. So now let's look at actual individuals. So the alleles are like if we actually know what their genotype is, if we know what the genes are. But we don't really know that a lot. We'd have to do genetic testing for that. It's complicated. So what we'll look at sometimes is what they actually look like, okay? So we'll look at how many homozygous dominant little kitty cats. Oopsies, those are these cats. And that's, they've got two alleles, so it's, think of it like B plus B, B squared. Then you've got your homozygous recessive. Little B, little B, I mean, my little B voice. And then you've got your heterozygous, okay? So you've got B plus B plus B plus B, right? Okay. So that means, so again, you're doing frequency, so you're going to add all of these up. My loves, this is a mathematical model. If your head hurts, if your brain is blown, um, if you think those cats are staring into your soul and plotting your murder, they probably are. So don't get too hung up on this. We are going to practice this extensively. I'm just kind of giving you the foundation of kind of where these come from. So the formulas, right? I kind of went over them. Let's kind of go over them again. You've got P plus Q equals 1. You've got your homozygous dominant, your heterozygous, and your homozygous recessive equals 1. The reason why they equal 1 is because it's 100%. We're doing frequencies, so it's got to, those frequencies are going to be decimals. We'll talk more about that as well. All right, so who cares, right? So say you have a population that's in equilibrium, okay? Say, for example, you've got this. This is your perfect. This is your Hardy Weinberg, right? Okay, so you've got 36, 48, 16. This is perfect. This is your perfect population. But wait a minute. This is what you've sampled. This is what you have in real life, okay? This is where we use the equation. We can look at these two numbers and we can say, wait a minute, what is going on here? So clearly, that's why we, how we use the Hardy-Weinberg. We use it to understand our existing populations. So here you've got your recessive. Your recessive is about 0.16. That's what you thought it would be. That makes sense. But you've got way more heterozygotes than you do homozygous dominant. So what you can start to theorize is like, well, maybe there's an advantage here. To having this genotype. That's an example. That's what we're doing here. <laughs> so how do you work this? Okay, so if I were to ever ask you, like, you've got 100 cats. It's my dream. So you've got 100 kitty cats, okay? 84 of them are black, 16 are white. Well, how do you know? How do you know how many there are of each genotype, right? So let's figure this out. And this is super complicated. Just work with me on this. It's actually not super complicated, but at first it's terrifying. So we're going to assume that these guys are all in the equilibrium. In other words, there's no environmental pressures working on them. So you're like, okay, well, there's 16, there's 84 black, there's 16 white. Mm, how does this work? Well, if it's a black cat, it can be one of two genotypes, right? It can be either this or this or, oops, or this. So that doesn't tell us a whole lot. But if there are 16 white kitty cats, we know for sure that this is going to be, there are 16 with that genotype. So that's where we get started. We know that the Q squared is going to equal 0.16. Because if you go back to our formula, formula, this is Q squared. So you take the square root of this to get Q. You get 0.4. Therefore, your P must be 0.6 because these have to equal 1. And that's where I'm going to leave you. And that's just an example of the Hardy-Weinberg. Remember, we use this as a way to better understand populations. Okay? So please bring your questions. I will um, take a little bit more time next class period to kind of go over this with you and kind of take it step by step. Um, if it seems confusing, you're on the right track. It's okay to be confusing. It's okay to be confusing is what I just said. It's okay to be confused at this point, um, but we'll go over it together, and then you can go back and listen to this lovely lecture, and you'll say, I understand all of it. Thumbs up. 
All right. Um, if you're thinking to yourself, God, is Lighter going to use cat analogies this entire unit? My friends, the answer is, is yes. So, all right. Um, so bring your questions in, um, and we will talk about this next class period. I hope you feel smarter. Meow, meow, meow.